Okay, great. So a warm welcome to everyone. Thank you so much for joining our webinar. And, um, you know, uh, we're having this uh, webinar for the Red Shoes campaign that the Every Woman Treaty um, is going to be starting, has started actually. Um, so let me just talk, uh, let me first um, welcome our panelists. So a warm welcome to uh, Marina uh, Piskalova Parker. Um, she is um, she is the person who started the first um, battered women's helpline in Russia in 1993 um, uh, by the name of Anna. Uh, she is the winner of the Vital Voices Global, Global Partnership Award, and um, she is also part of our steering committee. So warm warm welcome to you, Marina. Thank and, you. Uh, Thank you. Sure, sure. And uh, do we have Eleanor online? Uh, let's see. I can just go ahead and introduce her and she can, uh, you know, whenever she joins later. Yeah, go ahead, Marie. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Zena. Yeah. She's yeah. not here yet, but so, she should be sure. momentarily. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yes, exactly. So, um, okay. So Eleanor, um, Eleanor can see us. She, she is online. Yep. So a warm welcome to you, Eleanor. Thank you for joining us today. Um, Eleanor is, uh, is the co-chair of the steering committee of Every Woman Treaty, and she is a doctor by profession. So uh, thank you for joining us today, Eleanor. Now, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the intersection between violence against women and um, uh, the COVID-19 lockdown. So as you know, the entire world has been in lockdown since February 2020. And it has thrown women into a position um, that they have no control over. And of course, the lockdown is uh, necessary and it's absolutely essential in keeping um, the, you know, the world safe from the virus. But what it has done is that it has allowed um, you know, uh, violence against women and girls to escalate um, and rear its ugly head again. Um, as you all know, uh, Violence against women and girls is on the rise um, since, um, since the lockdown of Feb 2020. Countries all over the world have reported um, an escalation in violence. Um, let me share some examples. The United States, um, you know, in the United States reports, there have been reports where women have said that abusers have threatened to throw them out of the house um, if they so much as sneeze or cough. Um, you know, in China, uh, you know, domestic violence cases uh, tripled in Feb 2020. Um, in Spain, uh, just in the first two weeks of lockdown, Spain re reported an 18% spike in domestic violence cases um, on their helpline. And France and Brazil have also reported a 40 to 50% rise in domestic violence um, since the lockdown. Um, so the problem is that, you know, although a lot of nations have, um, uh, introduced some measures to better protect women, such as, uh, you know, introducing code words like mask 19, that women can, um, you know, walk into a pharmacy or a shopping mall and sort of say this word and, um, you know, let that the other person know, the pharmacist know that they're in trouble. Other nations have banned the use of um, the sale of alcohol and firearms during the lockdown. Um, countries like Italy have opened up their hotels to ac uh, accommodate victims of domestic violence. And, um, you know, the UK has said that, you know, um, if a woman violence, she can break a lockdown protocol and seek shelter. But I think what we need to discuss today, more importantly, is what the lockdown has brought to the forefront. Um, and I have a couple of points that I wanna go through before I open up the discussion to the rest of the panelists. So number one, the lockdown, um, you know, obviously is essential, um, you know, to, to lower the risk of people contracting the COVID-19 virus, but it, it has obviously increased domestic and sexual violence against women. Um, there are certain countries around the world, such as Bangladesh, Pakistan, I can only speak um, for South Asia since that is the region that I belong to, 
where there are no mechanisms in place to protect women. So there are no existing mechanisms that can be strengthened at a, at a critical time like this. Um, and with the result that the entire burden um, to sort of curb violence against women and girls during this time and curb sexual violence has fallen on the NGO sector and the helplines. And the problem is that shelters have stopped accepting more occupants because of the disease, because of the virus. So um, I think that if before um, COVID-19, there was any doubt in anyone's mind that, you know, um, that violence against women and girls is a huge issue and that it's, it is on the rise, um, I don't think that there, there can be any doubt since the lockdown. Um, the United Nations, of course, is calling this the shadow pandemic, but, um, you know, uh, I, we are stuck with this pandemic today because, you know, existing mechanisms that are out there right now to protect women are, are not really, have, have been unable to protect them against violence. Um, you know, and, and I think, you know, when we talk about violence, we forget that, you know, the lockdown has sort of created um, uh, the, the perfect sort of atmosphere for first time abusers to abuse women and girls who are in their care. Um, you know, it's something that we don't um, talk about in, uh, often enough, and it's, um, it's a really dire situation because these women and girls have nowhere to go. They, uh, uh, in most countries, they have no uh, helpline to call. Um, as an example, over the weekend, I was, um, you know, I was uh, handling a domestic violence case and I tried to call the, the 1099 hotline that has been introduced in Pakistan, specifically um, during the lockdown, and there was no response from the, uh, from the helpline. Nobody answered it. Um, I had a lawyer call the helpline as well, and she was directed to an automated message that said that somebody would get in touch with her. And to, to, uh, to date, nobody has called her. Um, so that's, that's the situation in Pakistan. And um, one last point that I want to bring to everybody's attention before we open up the, the discussion is that, you know, there are a lot of cultural, social, and religious uh, complexities when you talk about um, women's rights and violence against women um, in, in South Asia. Um, just today, I was talking to, um, you know, a new coalition member of ours called Radha, and she works on, um, you know, uh, dignified menstruation uh, in Nepal. And uh, she was talking about how frontline workers in Nepal are facing a lot of uh, ostracization in, uh, in their country because they are working during their cycle. And, and there's a huge stigma attached to uh, menstruation. And so, you know, when we talk about violence against women and abuse against women, um, uh, during the lockdown, uh, I think there are a lot of complexities uh, that come into play and we should keep them in, in mind. And without further ado, I'd like to turn over um, the discussion to, um, sorry, just uh, give me a second, to Eleanor to talk about the impact and stories in Nigeria uh, and give us the medical perspective um, uh, on what's going on with the lockdown and uh, women in Nigeria. Thank you, Zainab, and welcome everyone. Welcome, dear friends. Uh, these are really challenging and unsettling times. I'm just coming from a meeting where I said, listen, history books are going to actually redefine history according to pre, during, and post COVID. And you know, the, 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 we have new words that are being, you know, put in front of us all the time. Lockdown, shelter in place, palliatives, you know, and it, it's just, you know, we, we have a new vocabulary. And then people are talking of the new normal. But one thing that has remained constant, you get an email, you get a message and somebody is asking, are you well? Are you safe? 
and humanity is turning more and more to faith, to family and to friendships. But let's talk about the pandemic within the pandemic because this is what it is. Here we have a pandemic of global pro proportions as announced by WHO. By God's grace, this pandemic will come and go, but there is a pandemic that has been here before. It has escalated during, and when COVID-19 goes, it will stay with us. One in three women, pre-COVID, suffering violence, around the world. In the UK, a charity called Refuge reported a 700 increase in the calls to its helpline in a single day. In South Africa, there were 87,000 incidents of gender-based violence in the 21 national lockdown in the first 21 days. There was a case from Kenya, a 16 year old young lady, a girl, Juliet, who was held captive by a man and sexually assaulted. And the attacker just flippantly reportedly said, oh, I kidnapped her because I needed female company to get through the government imposed COVID-19 lockdown. In Nigeria, where I live, in the first two weeks of lockdown, UN Women Nigeria reported that in 22 states, there was a threefold increase in violence against women and girls. And exactly as Zainab has so eloquently said, women who are locked down, or like the Americans would say, sheltered in place, need help. And what is happening is that governments are instituting emergency task teams, whatever you call them. In some cases, you have no women at all. And then they are giving passes to those on essential services, first responders. They are not thinking of those who can respond to these women who are locked down with their abusers. France has recognized that. And France has actually paid for 20,000 nights in hotel rooms for victims of domestic violence. You have pharmacies now where women, despite the lockdown, if they can just manage to get to the pharmacy, they can ask for a mask. And a mask means please call that hotline. So coded language is coming on board. You have buddies, friends who would normally respond to their friends, but now because they're scared of the virus, they are not responding to their friends. Husbands are discovering that their wives have phones with, with uh, uh, um, um, locks on them, and they are beating up their wives to tell them to unlock the phone so that they can find the numbers that their wives are phoning. We have security personnel who have been employed to put in place fines and to stop movement because of the lockdown. What is happening in Nigeria? Because the police force, as they are called, have the orientation that women who are either you know, prostitutes or commercial sex workers dress skimpily. It means that if a woman is escaping her abuser and she's wearing her nightie, the same policeman who she runs to for help will prejudge her because she is skimpily dressed in a nighty, not recognizing that she's dressed that way because she's probably escaping her abuser. Let's talk about the stigma of, the, of mental health and issues around isolation. In this culture and in many cultures, 
where there is a stigma around mental health, <clears throat> you're finding that you know, women who are either suddenly talking to themselves or showing the early signs of you know, mental health breakdown are being stigmatized. And within the shelter, now being locked in a back room because they're being seen as mentally ill. So the challenges are enormous. I have seen online a mentor of mine in widow's rights, Margaret Owen. Just yesterday, we lost a workplace colleague. We couldn't go to the funeral, but they posted um, pictures of the burial. The wife, the widow, could not be close by. Other people, so no closure for her. And then the statistics, the health statistics coming out now are that men are being affected more by COVID. They are dying more. And what does that mean? It means we have more widows. And remember that in some cultures, widows suffer an additional victimization, either because of harmful traditional practices or loss of their property or, or some you know, practices that inflict more harm on them. These are things we need to think of. So what are we doing as I round up as the Every Woman Treaty? We're calling on every government on earth to stop this predictable, well-known pandemic within the pandemic that is violence. We stand for lives free from violence for every woman and girl everywhere. And we call every nation on earth without exception to implement what we have discovered as evidence-based for delivering safety to our women and girls. Let's develop national action plans. Let's deliver comprehensively legal reform. Let's train physicians. I have some of my colleagues, I have to confess, who do not recognize violence when it happens. And especially now, when we're concentrating on putting PPE, we can't look beyond the COVID to recognize that somebody who has come in you know, with breathing difficulties may have been punched in the chest. So we need the training of the responders and we need health systems. This COVID has shown more than at any time in life, the inequalities and inequities regarding health systems around the world. The world needs to wake up and provide good health care systems for its citizens. Finally, there must be dedicated, ring-fenced funding specific to violence. I know the other panelists will add to what I have said. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Eleanor. Uh, you spoke so eloquently. Um, now I would like to turn it over to Marina about the situation in Russia regarding women and um, the COVID-19 lockdown. Yes, good evening. Um, at least in Moscow, it's good evening. Good afternoon and, and in some other parts of the world. Uh, a very important conversation. Uh, Russia is one of the examples why we need a global treaty, because uh, Russia still doesn't have a law on domestic violence. Uh, there are no mechanisms to protect uh, survivors and victims of domestic violence um, in normal times. And now it's even worse, because basically state fails to do anything. Shelters are closed, social services do not function due to lockdown. Um, we have um, to receive a special pass to leave houses, electronic passes, and uh, if people leave houses without passes, um, it's a violation, it's, um, people have to pay a fine. Um, 
also uh, because there is no law on domestic violence minor injuries are not recognized as a public crime so it's uh, not a public prosecution it's private prosecution uh, law enforcement at the moment focused mostly on uh, responding to controlling uh, lockdown uh, implementation um, and they basically do not come or do not respond to calls on domestic violence um, so as you Zainab said earlier it is totally on the sh shoulders of um, NGOs in Russia and in the first two months uh, our helpline already have seen 30 percent increase in calls from women ac across the country um, as NGOs uh, we are very united and consolidated our resources at the moment because we do have limited resources we do not have state funding for that uh, that is why donations uh, private donations business donations um, grants like even global um, uh, isolated not alone campaign uh, we just received funding for uh, expanding our helpline and paying for emergency shelters for women and in this case what we mean by shelters is that we rent hotels uh, we rent apartments to help women who escape uh, of course we have terrible cases when pregnant women have to flee with little kids and uh, basically they are in the street um, nine ngos um, about three weeks ago we wrote an open letter to the russian government demanding uh, enforcing special measures uh, in responding to domestic violence during pandemic uh, the government hasn't responded to us but we just got um, news in the news a response from the interior ministry that reports a decrease in numbers of domestic violence so of course uh, at times like that the trust uh, from women to the state that doesn't have intention to protect them is very low and that is why women call us and they do not call the police uh, and the first problem with that is also because uh, it increases um, invisibility of this uh, issue in the official statistics um, on the other hand uh, the ombudswoman federal ombudswoman on human rights she stated that she also had an increase in complaints uh, twice uh, two times more in the last month so uh, and we have to keep in mind that during the pandemic and during isolation lockdown it is very difficult actually for women to seek help they even they have to escape run away uh, or uh, they will just stay there and um, until they can survive uh, it is very difficult under control of perpetrators to call a helpline. We are developing chat online services at the moment. Um, and we realize that uh, after pandemic, we will have several like shock waves of increased domestic violence uh, just because of the situations that are developing now. We have to keep in mind that this will real wave, will be a real wave uh, of violence afterwards also because uh, due to all the social distress uh, all the other factors that contribute to increased domestic violence uh, of course we have also issues with um, harmful cultural practices increased in northern caucasus uh, we just wrote several organizations we wrote a complaint to the investigative committee because uh, one clinic in Dagestan just uh, 
actually uh, executed FGM uh, surgery during pandemic on a little girl. And uh, just to even to imagine that they build the desert, they take that as a priority at this dangerous time is really crazy to think. Uh, why global treaty? Because nothing else works. And also, I think, because the global treaty uh, will show, will demonstrate that the world globally is ready to recognize the problem and really, truly ready to commit to uh, changing the situation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that, Marina you brought up that there you know we are going to be expecting uh, shockwaves of domestic violence and right now currently we're just discussing what's happening in uh, during the lockdown but of course there will be a lot of economic repercussions once the lockdown is over and that will you know put more of a burden um, and um, you know abusers are bound to um, sort of uh, become more violent during those stages so thank you for bringing our attention to that and many other issues. Um, I would like to, before we move on, I would like to acknowledge um, another panelist who unfortunately could not be with us uh, today, Najla Ravakjan from Afghanistan, who is um, a judge and um, uh, currently lives in the United States. Uh, Najla is somebody who also worked on Afghanistan's constitution. Unfortunately, she could not be with us, be here with us today. Um, her mother passed away today, and uh, but Najla had reported that um, you know the helpline um, for domestic violence in Afghanistan um, has uh, not been shut down, but has actually been um, uh, designated to take um, COVID uh, nineteen cases instead. So uh, they're no longer uh, uh, taking domestic violence cases on the helpline. They're taking COVID-19 cases. So uh, that is the update for now from Afghanistan. And um, since Najla was unable to join us, um, you know, um, before we uh, turn over to the Q&A session, um, there's just two other things that I want to point out about Pakistan. While I was doing my research today, um, you know, uh, number one, uh, you know, the government took very long in acknowledging that there is a connection between um, the COVID-19 lockdown and domestic and the rise of domestic and sexual violence within the country. And even today, the government is not reporting on the increase of violence against women in the country and they are not collecting any data. So the figures that I went through in the beginning regarding various countries around the world, as far as the, the, that data is concerned, we have none in Pakistan because nobody is collecting it, you know? So, uh, but now I would like to turn it over uh, for the Q&A session. I had requested panelists to please share their questions uh, within the chat box. So let's just go through. Okay, currently I don't really see any questions. Lisa, we could go with yours. Um, so, um, you know, uh, Marina, you had mentioned um, that there has been a spike in calls um, uh, to hotlines in Russia. And whereas the Russian government claims that there is a reduction in cases. So um, how do we make sense of that? So the helplines are saying that there's been an increase in calls and the government is claiming the, uh, the exact opposite. So, so what would you add to that? Well, it's very simple. The helpline is an NGO helpline. It's my center helplines. Mm -hmm. It's national helpline, but it's not funded by the state. 
and uh, our statistics show a 30% increase already. And this is also related to what I said earlier, women have very low trust to the state because basically state um, fails to respond to domestic violence. So official statistics will, no show, uh, will not um, reflect on increase for two reasons. We do not have a law on domestic violence. So domestic violence is not defined anyhow in legislation. Uh, especially at early stages, it will be some, some kind of uh, family dispute. But because it's private prosecution, women basically cannot go, courts are closed. Women cannot go to courts and claim anything until they are severely injured. And so we will have again like a top of the, an iceberg in um, uh, very heavy cases of severe um, injuries and murders. But most, like 90% of cases, will be invisible to the state statistics. OK, all right. Thank you. Um, I see that Margaret Owen has a question about the impact of COVID in refugee camps in Syria and elsewhere. Um, Okay, so um, so okay. For some reason, I cannot, um, Elizabeth. Uh, I cannot uh, see the question here. Sure. Um, I think so. I'll uh, ask Eleanor to to answer a question. Um, okay. And then uh, and then I'll think I'll just let uh, Margaret speak. Okay, that would be great. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. That way, I'll I'll unmute Margaret in just a moment. But there's a question um, regarding regarding the uh, the situation in Nigeria. Uh, Chidima uh, says that the lockdown there is not giving room for women to speak, and the helpline is not available to women in rural areas. Eleanor, do you want to speak more on that uh, on that situation there? Yes, Chidima is absolutely correct. When you look at mobile phone um, connectivity, number one, um, availability of the hardware, that is a phone, and then, um, you know, the cost. What do you find? It's the usual situation that those in the rural areas are the ones that cannot afford to have a handset. When they can afford to have a mobile phone handset, they cannot afford the data. When they can afford to have the data, the masts or mobile connectivity you will find is affected. So that distance already between the urban and the rural dweller further reinforces the issues. So when we are really, let's be realistic here. If we're talking about helplines, it's the same route that you're looking at if you're looking at access to healthcare more broadly. When I tell people in Nigeria that I have personally seen pictures of women in labor being rushed in a wheelbarrow, or you know, trying to get transport to, so that she can get skilled care when she is delivering a baby. And that's why I said in my, in my uh, re earlier remarks that, the, that COVID-19 has brought to the fore the inequalities and inequities that exist globally regarding healthcare systems. And what has COVID done? COVID has shown that it is intergenerational. It does not recognize the rich or poor. It's affecting everybody. It does not recognize those barriers that have come into place regarding you know, religion, et cetera. The time has come for us to get governments to wake up. They have to wake up and institute equitable healthcare systems. And then they need to look at our rural poor. 
I will leave Margaret to answer the question about you know, refugees, but we are dealing with internally displaced persons who are in a similar situation. And in fact, in Borno state, where we have the conflict with Boko Haram, the first person, the index case was an aid worker. So here you have aid workers paying the ultimate price in trying to save a life to get that ultimate prize with a Z of saving a of, of actually saving a life. So as we move through the, the intra-COVID era and we begin to think of preparedness in a strategic, robust, and purposeful manner, we must look at making sure healthcare is equitable we must make sure that this pandemic that we are speaking of today that exists within the pandemic and will exist after the covid pandemic must be addressed and a treaty a global treaty will make the world safer sooner for every female on earth Thank you. Thank you for that, um, Eleanor. So uh, now I'm going to turn it over to Margaret to ask her a question. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, Margaret. Right. Luckily, you can't see me. That's a good thing. <laughs> well, it's not so much a question. It's actually a clarion call for all of us in every country we live in, to see how, as Eleanor so eloquently has described it, how this COVID epidemic has shown the appalling injustices of our healthcare systems everywhere. I'm speaking from London in the UK. And what has happened is that many more people, we've got the highest death rate in every country in Europe, and particularly quite disproportionately to their numbers in the population. The most people are dying are particularly from BAME, black mixed race, and also among the poor. The poor are dying, not just in hospitals. We haven't even got the data. They're actually dying, not even just in the care homes. They're dying at home because they can't go to hospitals. But I think we know this is happening everywhere, that in this country as well, women are incarcerated under lockdown with their abusers in their own homes. So just like, as Eleanor has said in Nigeria, in the UK, in every country, the violence against women has actually tripled under this lockdown. But what I wanted to talk about now, because I can't see um, uh, Eleanor also quite rightly is talking on the desperate need to have statistics. And as our friend Marina in Russia has said, you know, the fact that we don't even have any data, and I'm really I must weep for what's happening in Russia, which is a country which has got no even legislation um, about domestic violence. But really, I want to talk about that most invisible of all for women and girls. It's the women and girls who are in refugee camps. I'm very involved with what is happening in Syria, where Turkey has actually close the border for all UNWHO humanitarian aid to go to northeast Syria, which is home now not only to over 650,000 refugees, but to over 5,000 ISIS captives, which include many women, some of whom have been lured on 
misunderstanding have got themselves involved with ISIS and are there. Wherever they are, they are captives, but wherever they are, whether they're in prisons or refugee camps, they have a right to justice. And what has happened? Turkey has not only closed the border so that no humanitarian aid can go to that part of Syria, it must go to Damascus, to the Assad regime, but and this is a war crime. In January this year, they closed the water flow. They closed the water. So there's not this idea that people can wash their hands in seconds, they can keep washing their hands, or that they can distance themselves. There, we're talking about refugees with no water, no warm water, no soap, no electricity in overcrowded camps who've got no possibility of actually distancing. And the ISIS women in the al Hol cap are telling the women, ah, oh, but this COVID-19, the coronavirus, it only attacks infidels and non-Muslims. So that the women don't even report if they are ill, because that would actually, that's a stigma that they are infidels and they are non-Muslims. Again, let's go to Bangladesh. There's a special camp just for the Rohingya widows. Mm. Look at what is happening in Greece. A lot, I mean, widows and wives that have disappeared and their children predominate in refugee camps. And these countries who actually are blocking humanitarian aid. They are committing war crimes. You know, it's a war crime to cut off the water in a conflict. So I'm asking all of you from all your countries in the world to put pressure through UN women in your own countries to their governments. We're trying hard at the Security Council to bring this up about the particular terrible violence against women that is happening. In this country, of course, the majority of our health workers, our online health workers, doctors and nurses and care workers in nursing homes, in care homes, they are women, but they're also women who come from many different ethnic backgrounds. I mean, how we depended upon these wonderful women who came from the... Yes. Uh, uh, Margaret, no, I'm, I'm sorry. You want me to stop? I'm just saying. Sorry, sorry, Margaret. We're running out of time. Which has been totally neglected. And I ask all of you to take account of it and do what you can. Thank you very right. much. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Um, I've just found out that Najla has joined us. Uh, Najla Rahwakjan. So, uh, Najla, thank you for joining us and our sincere condolences um, on the loss of your mother. Uh, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Najla? Najla, your, uh, your audio may be muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. we can hear you. Okay, so thank you so much. I was on the meeting from the beginning, but because you, yeah. you have muted uh, system. That's why my phone was muted. I was on my phone. Sorry about that. But um, I I just keep sending emails, and finally I had to open my computer, move from something to come here. I'm sorry. So, anyways, um, yeah, I listen to all of you, and it's very really interesting. And thank you for. Uh, I'm 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 grateful to see you all and meeting you all. I'm sorry, it's a very bad situation for me, but still, I'm committed to my work, and I and I love to do this now. So. Um, uh, I, I'm sure that each one of us knows that Afghanistan is also one of the, uh, on the top of the list and the dangerous country for women to be in. Um, uh, I'm sure you have these data, and particularly I, I heard from other colleagues that they don't have even elimination of violence against women's law. Though we have in Afghanistan elimination of violence against women law, it was not passed from the uh, parliament, but still it's functioning because we made a move, a very 
smart move to sign the law by the president of Afghanistan, by the ex-president of Afghanistan. So now it is based on the elimination of violence against women law. Most of the cases are uh, solved within the, within the system. But because the violence against women is so normalized in Afghanistan that um, even the authorities, um, I mean, uh, the authorities within the system, they are not, um, they are no, not looking at it as a serious problem. Um, or one of the reasons is because there are so many things involved in women, uh, 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 particularly domestic violence and domestic abuse, that the uh, victim becoming uh, uh, based on, unfortunately, based on the system, corrupt system, they are becoming as a perpetrator of the uh, like so-called uh, moral crimes. And as well, so many other factors are, are involved. Shaming victims is one of them. Social and cultural stigmas, which uh, it is shame for women to go out and disclose their issues, their family issues, as well as economic vulnerability of the woman is also another point that the women are unfortunately dependent to the men in the society, particularly their, their main members of the family. So based on what, what, uh, what is happening, particularly that now, because of the pandemic in Afghanistan and globally, it's a, it's a disaster. Uh, in Afghanistan, we had 6464 number. It was a hotline, which I'm, I'm proud to uh, report that I was, um, I was one of the founder when I was working with my previous job for this hotline, uh, that the women were uh, reporting their um, issues, and as well as they were getting um, uh, answers, I mean, uh, 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 the right answers and also referrals and getting uh, referrals to safer places. But unfortunately, because of the pandemic, uh, I don't know if I'm sure that you all know that because the pandemic became a source of income for most of the corrupt governments, that's why now they shift the humanitarian aid. Somehow they are uh, under, um, underestimating the importance of the woman being abused. Uh, and also the uh, the domestic violence within the families. That's why they are shifting even international donors. I'm sorry to mention this in Afghanistan now because temporarily they stopped the hotline that the people were, the women were um, reporting their, uh, their, uh, their domestic violence issues. But now they put it as a, um, as one of the, uh, they say 166 uh, pandemic report, which now why, uh, why it's 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 a dramatic shift from reporting the domestic violence to reporting the pandemic because as Eleanor mentioned it's a pandemic within the pandemic because they know this is becoming a source of income for the not only for unfortunately for the government but but also for the uh, uh, humanitarian aids uh, uh, um, uh, institutions which I'm I'm sure many of you know that all of them are not exactly on the right place anyways. So um, in that particular issue, it's uh, like one of another issue I would like to even report here that uh, my mom, because we lost my mom because of the lack of movement, close of borders, because we couldn't take her for the treatment. This is a huge impact uh, personally in me and my family. So you can see that this is a, a kind of, not only even if you don't have a domestic uh, abuse within your family, but the social and the environment in the political situation, particularly with this uh, pandemic, is giving you a, a kind of, you're a victim of a, 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 a this, a, this sort of behaviors. So anyhow, uh, I can go on and on, but I think it's, uh, it's time to, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that we have to um, alert not only uh, uh, the international community on um, having an international treaty, but also alarming international humanitarian aid institutions and, 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 and resources to, to be more uh, critical, particularly addressing the women's issues or domestic violence and not putting the women in a situation that they will be the already victim and they will be double and triple victimized. Thank you. Thank you for that, Najla, and thank you once again for joining us. 
uh, even considering what's, uh, especially considering what's going on um, in your life personally right now. Uh, we now have a question from Com, uh, from Marina, uh, who is asking, are Russian NGOs allowed to accept funding from outside the country? And are NGOs allowed to operate freely in the no Northern Caucasus? So Marina, if you could just unmute yourself, please, and, and answer yeah. that question. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Yes, thank you. Um, actually, that's what we do. We now fundraise outside of the country um, and inside the country uh, because there is no state funding for us and for uh, the situation in Russia at the moment. Uh, NGOs in Northern Caucasus can function, but um, it's not as open and as visible many times as um, it is in the rest of Russia. And also our solidarity is very important. So for example, uh, the case in Northern Caucasus of FGM uh, on um, little girl, it was actually uh, brought to the attention of authorities by organizations in Moscow, but we got the information from organizations in Northern Caucasus. And sometimes that's how we have to function. Uh, we also um, have cases when women have to escape from um, Northern Caucasus and organizations across the country, we sometimes um, help women to go from one region to another um, because they are in danger of honor crimes. There were several cases lately when we helped women to escape uh, because they would be uh, killed as, um, as part of honor crimes in some republics on, in the Northern Caucasus. Okay, great. Um, uh, thank you, Marina. There's just one uh, question, uh, one more question for you from Linda McDonald, who is, um, who is asking that there has been an increase in the creation of pornographic material of children um, during this lockdown. And um, she wants to know if you have heard of such non-state torture crimes um, in Russia, and if you could talk well, more about that. Um, I'm not a real expert on that but of course we know that all type of porn um, beca became really popular and the most horrific one is children's uh, using children for porno um, and uh, yes i've heard about that i know um, but i also know that i think state uh, investigates these cases in Russia, uh, cases of crimes against children most of the time investigated better and more diligently than um, crimes against women. Women are the least priority in Russia. Okay, okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for answering that, Maria. Um, uh, this is a question directed to all um, uh, panelists from uh, Folata. Uh, and the question is that what is the impact of COVID-19 on commercial sex workers in your countries? Well, I can start maybe answering sure, that. Sure, sure, please go ahead. Uh, first of all, uh, it's um, also one of the issues that is not defined anyhow. And that's why uh, they are another um, vulnerable group that has no um, any kind of state support with um, I mean they are much more vulnerable um, than um, average citizens at the moment uh, and also due to stigma and all of their um, um, judgments um, related to that um, at the same time, I've also seen reports that 
um, there is an increase in using commercial sex during pandemic also. But um, of course, that puts more and more women at risk um, because there will be no any um, precaution um, used for uh, these women do not get ill. So I think this is one of the most vulnerable groups at the moment, um, together with actually a lot of migrant women that we have. We don't see, for example, Moscow is the city that has uh, a lot of migrants. And among uh, sex workers, uh, there are also women, migrant women, from uh, and they are invisible to the system, to the state system. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we do have the whole like piling a uh, number of issues related to vulnerability of women uh, uh, because of pandemic, vulnerable to basically getting ill and not getting basic medical help, and also very vulnerable to violence against uh, that can be committed against them. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for answering that question, uh, Marina. Eleanor, I'll come to you next. And if you could briefly just answer the question, as we have two other um, agenda points to cover before we um, sign off today. Yeah, very quickly, just thank to you. add to what Marina has uh, mm -hmm. said um, already. You know, I, um, I try to explain that things are going to be redefined in a different timeline now. And I can tell you that pre-COVID, we already had commercial sex workers stigmatized. They were being rounded up, you know, while conducting their business at night. And now that additional layer that comes with, you know, the sex for survival in the situation where they are not counted amongst the vulnerable groups for palliatives. So here we're looking at, you know, uh, uh, the, the, we're looking at the rural poor, we're looking at internally displaced persons, we're looking at pe persons living with disabilities. But for the commercial sex workers, especially those who, you know, need, uh, are using sex for survival, they are not, they're uncounted. All right, now can you imagine what's happening in the context of limited movement? So obviously they can't, you know, carry out their trade. And in addition, you know, it's that much more difficult, you know, to access their customers. So there's the additional situation of lack of access to cash. We do not have a cashless system in Nigeria. We depend on going to what we call the ATM machine. Mm -hmm. And uh, what happened during the lockdown situation was that the ATM machines got to a stage where they were not even delivering the cash. So here again, we have yet another layer imposed on what, what is an already vulnerable group. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Najla, would you like to answer uh, the question as well? Um, actually, uh, in Afghanistan, we don't have a very visible uh, uh, sex workers. Uh, I mean, uh, formally, because it's an Islamic country. But yes. at the same time, they are a very hidden, uh, though it is visible for the society, but it's a very hidden, uh, uh, act, it is a very hidden activities. And I'm sure that you understand what I'm talking yes, about. Yes, yes, of course. I do. And this yeah. population is so vulnerable because they are from, first of all, they are, uh, culturally, uh, they are uh, vulnerable, and and it's they were they are rejected by the society. But at the same time, they are vulnerable from health perspective because yes. they don't even they cannot report because of this uh, social and uh, and and cultural barriers, particularly in in religious barriers. Mm -hmm. So this is a very uh, a very uh, critical time for uh, for these sex workers. Uh, uh, within the society that even they will be not and 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 uh, this should be somehow the international community particularly which actually we do also have some uh, organization they are also headingly working within the uh, uh, within the society because it's it's also uh, those organizations will be vulnerable also will be will be attacked by extremists and religious groups so uh, in that case i think it's uh, in my uh, opinion it's good to talk with more international communities um, 
to 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 bring those sort of uh, particularly within this crisis to bring those sort of humanitarian aids and at least to uh, referral system for the uh, for any type of medical uh, treatment for these women. Yes. And, and can I just jump in quickly from a health perspective to also say that in the context of the lockdown and lack of access to um, pharmaceutical products, medications, they would also have less access to, for example, condoms, lubricants that, that would protect them. So, you know, they're caught up in that general lack of access to, to these uh, uh, um, commodities. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for adding that, Eleanor. And just to bring it back, um, I think this has been a very, very uh, informative discussion. Um, thank you, Eleanor, um, Najla, and Marina for your perspectives um, on, on your countries. And I think more than ever, um, you know, um, our position of, of you know, um, our call for a global treaty on violence against women and girls has um, has strengthened and uh, the fi uh, the whole hand framework uh, that we have included within the within the treaty which is um, you know reforming the justice system raising awareness on violence against women and girls um, um, you know introducing survivor support systems that that would have really come in handy during this lockdown um, you know, and, um, you know, uh, and of course, uh, you know, uh, the funding um, that is required um, to do all this work, um, you know, is, um, um, that's really come to the forefront uh, with this lockdown. Um, you know, um, before, um, before we finish, I would like to call upon Elizabeth Blackney, the head of our communications department, to talk about the Red Shoes um, campaign that we have started. Um, so Elizabeth, can you tell us a little bit about that? Because a lot of panelists have been reaching out and they want to know more about uh, the Red Shoes campaign. Uh, sure. So uh, I want to share a little bit about our Red Shoes campaign. We, uh, we were deeply inspired when we, first of all, when we think about our mission and we want nations to commit to to commit to the interventions that we know make a difference, uh, whether it is understanding that there are profound impacts of violence against women and girls. As Eleanor was saying at the top of this call, that one in three women were already affected by violence against women before the current COVID-19 crisis. And, and to just tie this together, in 2009, a Mexican ar architect and activist, Alina Chauvet, Start, she lost her sister to domestic violence. She was killed by her partner. And she started an installation that's now been around the world called the Red Shoes Installation. They're beautiful, these beautiful red shoes um, that mark the murdered and missing women and women. Now in today's context, so many, so many women and children are forced to shelter with their abusers. So on June 4th, we're kicking off a week of global solidarity with all of the all of the women who are surviving violence right this minute, who are locked inside with their abusers throughout this global crisis. So we are asking you to join us in, in sharing your photos uh, on your social channels that week, beginning on June the 4th. You can send, send them to us at redshoes at everywoman.org. And if you want to share those there, that would be great. You can certainly feel free to share your stories about how you and your country are experiencing the COVID-19 crisis. And uh, we would ask you to share your, share your pictures and your stories. We will be collecting, collecting those and we'll be sharing a toolkit in the coming days for how additional people can participate in the Red Shoes campaign. Great, thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And I've also shared the email for Red Shoes uh, in the chat box for those of you who do not have it. So we're right on time. It's um, 11 p.m. here in Pakistan. Um, it's been a really, really informative discussion. Thank you to everyone who was able to join us today, especially our panelists, Eleanor, Marina, and Najla. Um, you know, so. Um, if uh, nobody else has any questions, we can sign off and call it a day, call it a night, really. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. Glad to Thank be Thank you, here. everybody. And certainly Thank feel you. free to send us your, your emails and questions at redshoes at everywoman.org. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Be Thank strong. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Stay safe. Thank, Thank you, Najla. Thank you, Thank Thank you for you coming so today. You're welcome. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.